Welcome to the Woman Warriors Podcast, where we're working to help you call a truce with your anxiety. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now, here's your host, Elizabeth Cush, LCPC. Welcome back to the Woman Warriors podcast. Today, my guest is Marisa Gowdy. She describes herself as a writer, story healer, writing coach, word witch, and priestess of sovereignty. She currently lives in New York's Hudson Valley. And today we are going to talk about the healing power of writing. I hope you enjoy the conversation. This week's episode is sponsored by Progression Counseling, providing Maryland residents with individual, group, and online counseling for the overstressed, overwhelmed, and overanxious. Find out more at progressioncounseling.com. Hi, Marisa. How are you? Thanks for joining us on the Woman Warriors podcast. Oh, I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so I'm really excited to talk to you, but I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself um, and how you came to this path of having writing being your your thing. Mm, big question. Um, <laughs> you know, I was I'm one of those who was definitely you know essentially born with a pen in my hand. So mm-hmm. writing was always my thing. Um, But I definitely went through long periods of denying that and saying, not me, I couldn't possibly, there are other people who are more skilled at it. Um, And also feeling like, oh, no, I have to do real work, because writing is is too, it's too much my passion. Um, And I think coming through that and understanding that in and of itself has been really, really important to being able to do the work that I do in order to hold and support others as they listen to that call inside themselves that say, I I have to write. I know what I think when I write. There's something important that I haven't written down yet that I need to see. There's a book out there that only I can create and I need to read it. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point, I call myself a story healer and a writing coach. And depending on what company I'm in, I will also call myself a word witch. Mm. um, Because there's a lot of magic that goes into this process. Because um, writing in and of itself is beautiful, and painful, and time consuming, and horrible, and the best thing in the entire world. (laughs) So I tend to find that, you know, you have to go at it Yes, as a writing coach, but you got to bring in the healing and the magic pieces as well. So um, I work one on one with clients, um, you know, helping them work on, you know, kind of the specifics of writing and making a piece work, but also talking about what's the why behind a story? What what is it that you need to to express? How can you can I I often walk with people through, you know, the messy pieces that they would never say or express out in public, but need to be sure that they've uncovered all the stones. Um, In so many ways, you know, my writing coaching becomes either an adjunct or a follow up to people's therapy practice, um, therapy work. Um, As it's that, you know, once you've, you've gone through with, with a therapist and gotten that support and done a lot of that basic healing work, it's that, okay, let's start to hit, how can writing help you make sense of it and support your process um, mm. and help keep moving you forward into a, into um, wherever that next space is that you, you want to be or that you could be. Mm. And um, I also just, a lot of my work has turned into holding space for people to get the writing done. So it's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to really make this grammatically amazing and it's going to make sense and I'm going to get it published. Like that's, that's important. Absolutely. But there's the part that I've really been drawn to over um, the last year or so has been saying, let's just make space for you to get this writing done and to give yourself the permission, the space, the time, the right to explore your own stories and all their contradictions and all their messy pieces. And, um, like I said, just give yourself room to do that because that in and of itself, I think, is what most often stops people from even beginning and even thinking writing could be part of their lives. Yeah. Oh, I would 100% agree. And and 
I think the permission piece is so huge because like, I, I mean, especially as women, I feel like there's so much like, well, my story isn't that important or what I have to say isn't enough or I don't have the tools or the words or the, you know, there's so much judgment around it that just giving yourself permission to have the space to just write is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I do feel like there are people who are more drawn to writing than others. I don't know if that's how what you have found or if you feel like that's just something that is could be a part of anyone. I think there are people who are more drawn to it, perhaps because they have, you know, just a natural inclination or a natural skill. I think that there's a degree to which, you know, people are born with or have very early on been nurtured in order to develop certain skills. And some people are more verbal than others. Some people are athletes and speak with their bodies. Some people are artists and create with their hands and create visual things. And some of us are born to be more verbal. That said, I don't think, you know, and I think that's what may make it feel easier for people. But I Mm -hmm, think mm -hmm. everyone can have that experience of feeling drawn to write because, you know, we are in a world that's constantly surrounded with words and language, right? And I think we, you know, as human beings, language and speech and words in the written and, and spoken form are our birthright. So we all have that have that call it's just whether or not it is you know seen and can be held and that you can hold it for yourself enough to say yeah you know what this may not be Shakespeare this may not be um, Margaret Atwood but it's something that I need to try and I need to begin and tell us how I mean I know that writing has been pretty healing for me um it's interesting to, I think, because sort of approaching writing, sometimes just that approach can be healing just because you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. But the actual process of writing can be so healing. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's certainly something to be said for for speaking aloud what it is that's going through your mind. And there's certainly something to be said for, you know, sitting on the meditation cushion and, you know, being still and and being with your thoughts, um, or, you know, sitting and watching the sunset and just allowing your mind to roam. Um, In and of themselves that those moments of of introspection, whether you're speaking, you know, to someone else, you're recording your own voice, you're just talking into the air, or you're sitting silently, have absolute power and resonance and have their place. There's something, though, that I find to be so magical and necessary about sitting down to write and knowing that as you do, you are able to empty yourself and you don't have to retain anything. As soon as it goes onto the page, you can you, you know that it's held there. And then you can move on to the next thought and the next and the next. And that suddenly opens up the entire container, I guess you could say, so that you can really roam very freely because you don't necessarily need to hold on to the idea you had at the beginning of your writing session because it's there. It'll be there to come back to. So you can just keep kind of spooling for on and on and in and out and keep exploring and actually allow part of your brain to rest, that part of you that's so intent on holding on to, oh my gosh, I have to remember this and this and this. You don't need to. It's there. It's on the page. And um, I personally am one of those historian kind of writers. Like I have, I've had the same leather bound journal since I graduated from high school. And I have now more than half a lifetime of little black books that were in that journal and now are just, they're in stacks on my office floor right now because I'm working on my memoir. Um, But oftentimes they're they're kept away in in drawers and in cabinets. Um, But knowing that those ideas are all there for me, offers such solace. Mm. Um, I know in some people's cases, it might be like, oh, heaven forbid anyone should ever open those and see them. I'd be so appalled to see what I wrote myself at 23. I'm wired a bit differently, but in the sense that if it's there, it's, it's, I feel immensely comforted by that. And, you know, I haven't actually checked that idea with a lot of other people in terms of saying it in quite that way. I'm actually a little curious what your response to that is and what you've seen and what you might know in yourself. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. There was a period of, there have been periods of time in my life that I've journaled, 
I don't know if daily, but much more regularly than I do now. Um, I think I write for different reasons now, but when we were away traveling, which I, you and I were talking about before we started recording, but when we were away in Ireland, I felt this desire to have in writing what we were doing. One, because I wanted to remember and I knew it was going to be a busy trip, but two, it, like you said, it sort of put it in a place that I could say, okay, this is here. And I know I can come back to this if I need to. Mm -hmm. And that was very comforting. I would say, as you were talking about your black books, I was like, hmm, I wonder what happened to all those journals? Do I have them somewhere? And I don't know the answer to that. So they may be in a box in my basement somewhere. So I might have to go look. <laughs> <laughs> or not, but to, or not, or not. It's that sense of you know we have that that choice, right? To come back if we want to, we can come back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there are other people who are just you know they burn a journal at every you know certain time at every year. They have a bonfire. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine. Um, mm -hmm. I have trouble like burning a piece of paper in order to set an intention. Um, but I know that you know that's how certain people are wired, and that's important for them to kind of keep moving through and um, you know release one story before they tell another one. Yeah, yeah. Well, and to me, just the power, so as a therapist, like the power that stories can have over us, like stories mm -hmm. that were created in childhood in our families about us, but also then recreating the stories that are truly us in adulthood can be an incredibly empowering, uh, moving journey. Um and I'm interested in, you know, for you, do you see that with your clients? Is that stuff that you guys work on together? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, oftentimes we think of it as, you know, your small S stories and your capital S story. Hmm. Um, and sometimes that may or may not be a, you know, st capital S stories. I think we're certainly living a multitude of them. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to write something down, say, this is what happened to me. This is how I understand it. And look at it and recognize, but wait, you know, the power that it held when I was six, when I was 16, when I was 26, I get to review that. I get to revise that. I get to now say here, as I stand in this moment, I am the author of this story. I'm informed by these stories that made me into who I am and crafted my beliefs and crafted the world that I lived in. But I can also sit back and say, wait a minute, I'm the author. I have a degree of power and degree of sovereignty in my own story that I can not necessarily change what happened. I mean, facts are facts. I mean, as much as we live in a world where that's certainly twisted and, and gotten more difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, but we get to change the way in which it affects us. We get to change the way in which we would tell it. We get to, you know, it's almost like being able to shift the color of the lens that mm -hmm. we look back on it with enough to say, yes, I see that. I own that. I've, I've held that. And I choose to hold it this way because it enables me to stand in this current story that I'm living, my capital S story that helps me lean into the future that I'm creating that because I'm you know, we're in this process of writing our next chapter, right? Yeah, and I think, as you said, changing the lens, but creating new meaning, like for me, like that's been such a powerful uh, part of writing when I do choose to write about very personal things, which you've been a part of that process with me, uh, uh, at least for one piece. But, you know, there are so many times where we can sort of take away what or we've uh, internalized a meaning that maybe isn't our own meaning, if that makes sense. I'm sort of rambling here. But like, so we're taking away what other people have told us about that story. Like, you know, for me, I think I grew up believing I was this very whiny child. And I look back and I'm like, I really just wanted attention. You know, I just was trying to figure out the best way to get attention in a family of four where I was the second girl, third from the top, you know, mm -hmm. third youngest. And I think that was the way I was able to do it, you know? So like it, 
shifts the meaning of that, you know, and I don't even think I really was that whiny. But anyway, but you know, this was the story that I took away with me and held on to for such a long time that I'm now able to go, "Mm, maybe not, maybe not. And especially when you realize that's, that's, you know, that's an attack on your voice as a yes. woman and how that carries all the way through from everything we know that as women, we are so often, you know, called shrill or we're called, you know, mm-hmm. watch your tone, all those ways in which we're policed yes. by society, by other women, by people who love us, who are just trying to make sure that we're nice girls who fit in and that people are going to like us. Mm. Oh, the wounding in that. And then that comes down to that basic sense of, you know, we know that it's the voice that allows us to express our truths on the page and in relationships and in negotiations and all those different spaces. Changing that story is immensely powerful. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I feel like for women, the society's pressures to be yeah nice girls has Mm -hmm. just oh it can just crush you yeah and silence you yeah 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 i know for me right now i've been working a lot um with because of my new book i'm working on um you know stories from my own past and certainly very inflict inflected by what's going on today so in um I guess it was September, October when we're going through everything with the Supreme Court stuff. And there was mm-hmm. going back to the past and, you know, parties at, at high school and college. And all of a sudden, you know, binge drinking becomes a huge topic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the amount of time I didn't expect to spend thinking about my experiences in, in college when I was living in Ireland myself when I was young. And bringing through this whole different aspects of like, oh, what I was like being raised to be a drinker um, and what it was like to be a partier and to, to be to be a lot of fun and recognizing how many different stories I've had to tell in this process of kind of coming to grips with where I am today with what I, you know, what it means to be as a mother, what is it, what it means to, um, to, to take in news that we're, as we're talking about these things that, and listening to other people's reactions to it. Mm. Um, and I guess I only, I bring this one up only because I realize it's been a story that I've had a lot of fear and shame around probably even exploring, but it was so interesting to realize how universal it was, and to have it in the news in that way, in such a dark light, yeah. uh, it's just been a story. It's been something that I've really had to spend more time revisiting the small s stories of "Go oh God that night and that night and what don't I remember?" In order to stand more clearly in where I know I am now, mm-hmm. um, where I want to be, and what kind of story I want to tell in order to make meaning of those crazy nights mm-hmm. and what who I am now and who I want to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting, though, you know, that, and this is sort of off topic a little bit, but that like the whole binge drinking, partying girl is seen in such a different light than the binge drinking, partying man or male or boy, you know, um, yeah. Just we're told different stories by different different portions of our society and what our rites of passage are supposed to be looking like and what it means to become an adult. And, mm. you know, there's ways in which this is off topic, but it's exactly on topic in the sense that we tell our own personal stories and we explore our own personal stories in order to understand and because we're asked to understand um, what's going on in the wider cultural landscape, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. Did anybody listen to the way that Kavanaugh spoke to to one of the senators about, you know, have you ever blacked out without having some sort of visceral reaction and going back in time? If you lived in any sort of drinking culture kind of college, you went there. And I, I know I did. And it was like, oh, wow, this was a place I didn't expect to go. Mm. And, um you know, that's, I spent a lot of time writing through um, that. And it's, it's interesting that as we bring this up, I was just listening to your your podcast about, about sexual assault that I know we're coming up right around that time. So I'm sure that's part of the reason why this is so much on my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're all just 
we're living in the midst of in this super fast news cycle in this you know constant moving from outrage to outrage where we're in such the place where the personal is political and the political is personal all of our personal stories are so often they feel like fragments of them are being projected up on the national screen and being misunderstood and being dissected and being taken in completely bizarre directions how do we continue to recognize ourselves and, yeah. and who we are and who we want to be and who we think we might have been if we don't sit down with our own stories? Well, and to be able to tell them safely, you know, within your own, you know, in your own writing practices, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's a nice, you know, yes, if you choose to share it with the world, that's, that's fine too, but too, to be able to just explore in a very safe, contained way what your story is can be very healing too. Yeah, I love that you bring that up because there's such a, there's a hugely, though they're on the same continuum, you know, journaling just to throw your ideas on the page, developing a writing practice so that you have some um, discipline around it, you know, you're kind of consciously working on some different ideas in order to, you know, facilitate your own healing to, in order to really get to know what you think in order to, you know, sharpen and deepen your own thought process mm -hmm. is on one end of the spectrum that's could be really far from, you know, anything from putting up a Facebook status update to writing a blog post to submitting something somewhere. They may be related, but they certainly don't have to be in order to be worthwhile and necessary to your own process of becoming. Yeah, yeah, I 100% agree. And and it and two, I I feel that the process of writing is a process, right? I mean, it's 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 like practicing anything. Yeah. It gets rusty, but you can you can oil it back into shape by just taking some time and doing it. Yeah, because there's both process and practice. Like these two words are so intermingled, and they have their own um, unique meaning in the in the idea of writing itself. You know, because you have to when you sit with the idea of okay, writing is a process. I am not going to sit down and write something that's brilliant the first time around. I mean, I write every day, all day, most of the time, and. It's my first draft is it could always be better, you know, mm -hmm. and not just because I'm a perfectionist, but because I know that looking back on something, um, it, it I, there's ways in which I could make it more clear. I could remove some words. I could make sure that I connect the idea at the beginning to the idea at the end. So that there, that idea of it's a process and saying there's a bit of a commitment I need to make to this in the same way that, you know, you don't work out one time and all of a sudden lose the five pounds. Right. Yeah. Um, and then that idea that your process is held by a practice mm. where you are going to commit yourself in the same way you might commit yourself to your meditation practice or your yoga practice or, you know, that I know I go for a walk every day because it makes me feel good and I makes me get outside and I know I need sunshine. In a way, that's your walking practice. Um, you come to writing in a similar sense so that it becomes one of the rituals that supports your practice of being alive, your mm. practice of being yourself in order to live a life that's well examined and well inhabited because you're giving yourself room to pause and reflect. And that's not an option in most of daily life. Writing is one of those few places where we can still, you know, you turn out the sounds and it's just you and your thoughts and your hand on the page or, you know, might, you might be typing, but there's definitely some, there's certainly a lot of research that says there's, there's power in, in writing something out by hand um, and how it works with the memory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting. Um, I was having this experience this morning, writing a response to a query for a media, you know, somebody's someone else is writing a bigger piece that they wanted some input from others like myself. So mm -hmm. I was responding to it and, you know, I wrote it once and I'm like, ah, uh, uh, I just feel so stuck. I can't, I can't get out what I want to say. So I, I put mm -hmm. it aside and then I sort of spaced down the page, started again, but all those other words were still there, you know, and I'm typing, but you know, they're all 
at the bottom of the page. And I keep looking down at that and I'm like, oh, no. And so finally, I'm like, you know what? I just need clean. I need a new document. Let's just start it fresh. And, you know, stepped away from it for a minute. And then it just flowed. And it's like when it's, when it, I don't know, it's amazing that when it feels right, it's, it, you're like, all right, that's what I wanted to say. This is it. Yeah. 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 And Mm. just giving yourself that permission to say, wait a minute, this is going to take me more than five minutes. Yes. You know, I mean, I think we need that in so many parts of life. And certainly when it comes to responding to anybody for anything, whether it's professionally or whether it's, you know, okay, a text message should be really pretty short. But, you know, anything of any substance, it very rarely takes five minutes. And um, we, I think we live in a world um, and our instant society where we're constantly underestimating what it takes to really put something together. I mean, I put together an Instagram post and I can't say that it ever actually takes me less than 10 or 15 minutes. By Mm. the time it's all said and done, if I'm writing something that feels vaguely important, if I'm adding any words to anything, it's not a couple minute thing. Yeah. Um, Well, yeah, I was gonna say you want the message to be true and real. And that takes time. To find and that. There's, yeah, there's spontaneity that's important too, right? Yes, yep. But it's that sense of like, um, I, I, there's, there's, it's an Italian word called sprezzatura, mm. which was really important to um, Yeats and some of the other early 20th century Irish poets, which was the ability to do something and make it look effortless. Mm. Even though you may have been writing a poem for months but when you, you know, bring it forth, it's supposed to just look as if it sprang from your head, you know, like, like Zeus was like springing forth children. Um, <laughs> and, and I think we, we still live in that idea, like it's some sort of chivalric idea that we should just be able to like, you know, if you're creative, if you're smart, if you're a healer, if you're somebody who's, you know, making a name for yourself on the internet, you should just be able to like put these things out there. And, um, I think we probably also believe that those we follow and respect and and who, you know, create a lot of content, quote unquote, online, do things really quick and easy too. And I, I think that that generally speaking is is a myth. And that, you know, again, as you develop your practice, things come easier to you because you know your main stories and where you stand. So it's easier to bring ideas of the day or, you know, current concerns through your own filters and lenses so that you can say, okay, this is what I think about this because I've created a body of work um, and I know what I think. So I can put this out a little faster, but um, at some point somebody put in a heck of a lot of work in order to be really clear about their ideas and, and what they want to express and put into the world. Yeah. And so do you um, encourage like a daily writing practice in terms of like setting aside time how do you work with your clients? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it becomes very individualized. You know, there's for certain people, it's that sense of like, they want me to give them the homework of saying, yes, get up every morning and, you know, do something that gets you into your body a little bit, whether it's, it's whether it's just meditation and sitting up or whether it's doing some yoga. Um, and, and then write for a half an hour for an hour, some people really want that. And mm. others look at me with abject terror. <laughs> And most of the time, it's the difference of like, are you a mother of small children? Or Mm. are you at a stage in which you no longer have people who are, you know, staring at you at seven o'clock in the morning? Um, Usually the people who are more ready to develop a super steady routine, um, you know, are in a space in life where people are not demanding of their time in quite the same way, and they have more control over their own day. It's, It's the moms and those who are kind of living in more chaotic situations for one reason or another, who might thrive in saying no make like every week just make sure you set up some writing dates for yourself because Mm. it's not going to happen if you just hope that it will and it's probably not going to happen at 9 30 at night once everybody is in bed so if you can you know on sunday or on monday what's your what's your your what are your writing dates going to be and you know that's in part why i've created an online writers group is for, to give people at least an hour a week where they know this is what you're going to do you put it on your calendar because it's a meeting that you paid to be at yeah. and that sense of um of committing to yourself is is super important and that said you know just i 
you know, I myself am a mom of two and I live in that, I have long lived in that idea of, you know, my time is not my own and, you know, certainly not for writing. There's certain things I, that I must do mm -hmm. in order to make money um, or in order to make sure that everyone is clothed and fed. And it was very, very easy for a long time to put the writing off and put it to last and, you know, realize I was probably going a month and more without doing anything. Mm. Um, so there's, a, it comes to a point where I want to always be honoring and, 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 and flexible with people so that, you know, they, their writing practice supports them and, and vice versa so they can be in relationship with it. But I, I can't ever pretend that it isn't going to take some level of, of discipline and some level of conscious choices and some level of saying, no, not this. I'm going to write, you know, yeah. it's not yeah. having that glass of wine while cooking dinner. So you can stay fresh enough that you can actually write from nine to nine thirty at night. Right. It's saying, you know what? Netflix will have that show on next month or, you know, or and, tomorrow. And, right. <laughs> right. And, and just deciding like, especially if you're working on it, you know, if you're working on say it's, you know, working on a blog post or an article and you really want to get it done within a week. Great. Don't watch TV this week. Right. That's probably all the time you'd need um, if you can manage to be fresh enough at whatever point when you might be collapsing on the couch to, to watch something. Yeah. So, yes, having some sort of dedicated time, yeah. Whether, yeah, daily or weekly or whatever it might be. Yeah, just knowing that you have to do it intentionally because it's something that you are probably not going to just suddenly be struck with like, I feel like writing right now at the exact <laughs> moment when you actually have like two hours. Right. <laughs> Almost never, ever happen. I mean, if I ever somehow get myself a day in which like everyone's out of the house on a weekend, I'd be like, eh, I'm going to organize my closet. Like, exactly. No, like, 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 it's like I'll I'll organize my office. I'll do something. No, this is the time when they left the house so you could write. Yeah, Sit butt down, sister. <laughs> so, uh, Marisa, how do people find you if someone was interested in working with you um, or knowing more about the work that you do? How do they find you? I am at marisagowdy.com um, and I am in pretty much most of the online platforms you'd like to be. You can find me as, as Marisa Gowdy there as well. Um, and when you're there, you can learn a bit more about my um, online writing group called the Sovereign Writer Circle and also um, about my one-on-one -on -one work supporting people who are on their own writing journey and just want some you know, individualized coaching and um, some story healing because I do that work too of really helping to to hold the story and um, you know kind of midwife it in the process of how it comes through. Nice. If you had any, um, are there resources or tips that you feel like it would be important for the audience to know about? I am a huge believer in writing prompts. That is how I offer a lot of my the, the writing. Um, that's how I facilitate the writing hour in my group. But also, I do free. Uh, community writing practice about once a month and I it's generally posted right at the top of my homepage so that's kind of a, a great place to kind of get in and see what some writing prompts might be whether you can join us live to write or you'll just end up getting getting some of those so you can work on your own time and you know in general you can I, not all writing prompts are created equal in the world but if you feel like you're called to write do a Google search of, you know, maybe it's writing prompts for moms or it's writing prompts for for healers or writing prompts to deal with X or Y. Um, and I certainly have some of them included in my own blog. Um, some of my posts are devoted to, to writing prompts. But you realize you don't have to necessarily write alone. Even if you're coming to the page with a full heart, you still may not know where to begin. And writing prompts are a really beautiful and powerful way to to meet yourself and just to get started. And you may not stick with it for long. You may, the first couple minutes, you need that prompt and then you're off in your own personal stratosphere and that's exactly the way to do it. Mm, nice, I like that. Awesome, well, thank you so much for joining us today and talking about your own writing journey, but also how people can tap into their own. Um, I appreciate your being a guest. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining me and Marissa in our conversation about writing and healing. I hope that you took something away from that. I really um, appreciated her 
sharing her story on how writing has helped her, but also how writing can help heal old wounds, things we feel like we need to work through, helping us create a story that feels true and genuine in ourselves today. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Ciao for now from This Woman Warrior. Thanks for listening and subscribing to the Woman Warriors podcast. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guests' profiles at womanwarriors.com.